same as, as Peter. for Americans and for America. Um, and, you know, and, 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 and genuinely, I would have said that regardless of the outcome. I think the, the rest of the world is coming to terms with something that most of us in America came to terms with about three or four months ago, and that was no matter what was going to happen, we were going to be disappointed. And, um, and Daniel chapter 4 is a fantastic chapter. One of, the, one of the, like, vintage bad guys of the Bible is King Nebuchadnezzar. Um, you know, he conquers Jerusalem, completely, you know, decimates the city. He carries off exiles, and they, they, their names get changed. You know, he's indoctrinating them. He's persecuting God's people. He's just a bad guy. And in Daniel chapter 4, at the peak of his arrogance, God sends him a madness. And after his madness, he comes to sanity, and he gives glory and praise to the God of heaven, God Most High. And if I don't believe or if I'm cynical about God's ability to humble and to work in the heart and the mind of an arrogant world leader, then my vision of the gospel is severely anemic. It's really reduced to not much. And if I do, in fact, worship and serve a God whose gospel can humble even the most proud, then I should be encouraged. And I can be encouraged. And so let's, I mean, how, how ridiculous and cool would that be if, uh, if uh, President-elect Donald Trump became humbled and didn't just say, yeah, I'm a Presbyterian to get votes, <laughs> but actually gave honor and praise and glory to the God of heaven. That would be fantastic. So yeah, join me in prayer. That would be absolutely sweet. So yeah, I did grow up in America. Grew up in a, in a city called Indianapolis. Some of you might know it from the Indy 500 uh, race car, uh, yeah, race, race car race. Um, Christian home, fairly nondescript, kind of evangelical North American, non-denominational background, so it's hilarious. Uh, that this has happened. Um, everyone back home thinks it's really novel and is hoping I'll wear my shirt at least once. You know, I'm, I'm leaving tomorrow morning uh, for my brother's wedding. But we grew up going to church whenever the church doors were open. And, um, you know, and, and as part of that, you know how North American Christians sometimes have our, our sort of our Christian fads that we really like. It's like the prayer, did the prayer Jabez thing ever make it over here? Got your little prayer Jabez in your pocket. Yeah, yeah, that's gonna be good. Every time I do this, I can just think and uh, increase my, my, my territory, increase my landlord. You know, uh, the WWJD bracelet, you remember that, did that, okay, yeah. And you're like 17 years old, you're like, I want my WWJD and I don't know which color, so I'm just gonna get them all and wear them all on both arms and be like, yeah, I'm a Christian, hear me roar. Anyway. Endured all those kinds of things and, and, and learned, learned more and more about what, uh, what God's love for me in the gospel uh, was and is. And uh, it's been fantastic. And, and that path of discipleship has caused our paths to cross tonight, which is wicked cool. I'm, I'm pumped about that. And I'm excited to look at um, this little bit of the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Matthew um, there's chapter 6 where we read Matthew's uh, account of the Lord's Prayer. And I understand we're, you're in the middle of a series, and I, I listened, uh, or actually watched Tim's from, uh, from last week, so I saw a lot of the back of Mark's head. It was fantastic. Glad to see you sit vaguely the same place. Nice, consistent young man. Excellent. Sorry to humiliate you if that did. Um, but I, I admire that. So, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And we have this bit about lead us not into temptation. And what I'd love for us to do is with one finger in Matthew chapter 6, just flip over to James. It's just after the book of Hebrews quite towards the end of the New Testament. If you hit uh, Peter, you've gone too far. Um, one and two Peter. So look at James uh, chapter one, particularly verse 14. And it reads, but, uh, well, I'll start in verse 13 actually. It reads, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. 
But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. And I'd like you to spend a couple of moments, if you are in sort of a, a, a table or a group of seats, just discuss how these uh, two verses interact with each other. Lead us not into temptation. In James 1.14, each one of us is tempted when by our own evil desires we're dragged away and enticed. So go ahead and just do that for just three, two, three minutes, just quickly. All right, take just a couple moments to wrap up your conversation, wrap up your discussion. <laughs> All right, let's bring it back together. What were some of the thoughts? Does anybody feel bold enough to, to share a thought or two that you had as you discussed this relationship? Lead us not into temptation. Each one of us is tempted when by our own evil desires. Yes. Hey, you know what? We'll find out. Let's throw it to the wall and see if it sticks. Okay. You know what I love about this? What I really love about this bit of feedback is taking seriously the impact of the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus of Nazareth and how we understand the Bible. I mean, that is, that's huge. So many times we just kind of lift sort of moralisms or general good principles, and we, we don't really read the Bible through the lens of this isn't just what Jesus did, but Jesus is doing stuff today, and that actually does impact the way that we interact with the Word and the way we interact with each other. Excellent. Thank you for that. Any other ideas? Yeah. The Jewish understanding of it being a realm of God and the notion of it being a of everything. Okay. Okay, so kind of similarly, you get the Jewish understanding of the time. God's sovereignty means, you know, he's ultimately responsible in some sense, but maybe he's not. In, in, in the sense of temptation, James is bringing a, bringing a correction of some sort, potentially, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. 
Excellent. That's, a re- that's another really good point that's made here is, is we have to let the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus impact the way we understand the Bible. But at the same time, we can't allow that to then say, well, this sort of counts, and this maybe it doesn't. You know, we might, we might lose. So we need to be savvy, and we need to be wise, and we need to be discerning about how we, about how we do that. That's good. Um, here's some things I want to just look at very sort of briefly. When we read, lead us not into temptation, I think, I think you're right, and Steve mentioned kind of, it's this broad sort of, give us strength in the face of temptation. We take temptation quite, quite broadly, and we have this idea that each one of us is tempted when by our own evil desires, we're dragged away and enticed. You know, I want something, and I shouldn't want it, and I feel it deeply, and there's something, there's some, you know, yet to be sanctified, you know, dark corner of my heart that just is yearning for this thing that I ought not have, that I ought not um, indulge. You know, and, and there's a sense where, um, if we continue on in James, uh, verse 16 of chapter 1, he writes, don't be deceived, my dear brothers, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting sh- shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. And, and one way of, of un- understanding this is that these desires, they're evil desires. There are these sort of darker corners of our, of our heart and our soul that still have these yearnings that aren't quite on. They're not quite right. And what we need is a gift of God. And I think what's also interesting with this uh, James passage, if you have your Bible and you write in your own Bible, it's a, it, it, or if you're taking notes, Mar- Matthew 7, 11 and Luke eleven thirteen, And we can just turn there real quickly. I'll, I'll turn there and read it for you. You can write it down. Matthew 7, um, is it 7, 11? Uh, we'll start in verse 9. Jesus says, Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others, you do have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. And there's a sense that God gives us good gifts, and God gives us good things. And there's one sense when we read James, where we go, I have this desire, I want something, it's a little bit evil, I need to sort of park that, and I need to embrace the good thing that God wants to give me. You know, whatever evil thing I might want, it sort of, I ought to to come to terms that it pales in comparison to the good gift that is going to come from the Father of heavenly lights. Yeah? But then we look at, um, I think there's another layer to this that's interesting, in Luke chapter 11. And this is a time when Jesus is giving a, a very similar teaching. And it could be the same occasion. It could be a different occasion. I would imagine Jesus probably said the same thing more than once. And as he says the same thing more than once, maybe sometimes he says it a little bit differently than he did the first time. I've never preached the same sermon twice, even when it's been back to back. Um, So uh, Luke 11, beginning in 11, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And I think there's another sense where on, on a quite surface level, we go, I want something, it's an evil desire, it's bad, I need to exchange that and embrace this good thing that God, the Father of heavenly lights, wants to give me, and it's good. There's another layer where you go, These, this, this desire, it's an evil desire, it's a bad desire, and actually what I need is for my desire to change. And through the work of the Holy Spirit in me, the Holy Spirit works in mine and yours and all of those who believe in Christ in our hearts and in our minds to change our thinking and to change our feeling and to change the inward way within which we interact with the world around us so that we act differently. It's a change of the inner person that results in a behavioral change in our outer person. And so... When we're thinking about lead us not into temptation, there's one sense where we're saying, God, actually, would you by your spirit work in this 
inner realm of mine where I have these evil desires? And would you change the way I think and would you change the way I feel by your spirit so that I wouldn't live life walking into constant, you know, traps? Because the way I'm engaging with the world around me is differently. And I think that's an important part of saying, lead us not into temptation. Change the way I think. Change the way I feel. Because let's be honest, we're not all tempted by the same things. And what tempts us is based on what's going on inside here. And if God can change that, then he can give us the strength to withstand temptation. But then there's another interesting sort of thing to consider. The NIV translates these desires as evil desires. And that's an interpretive decision. And another way of just translating it is just simply desires. Each one of us is tempted when by our own desires we're dragged away and enticed. And we, we generally, I think, as, as Western Christians, shy away from anything that seems to be a rebuke on desire because that sounds awfully Eastern and kind of a bit Buddhist to us. You know, I just need to, I just need, as long as I don't want anything, as long as I don't have desire, then I can, I can accept the world as it is. The only source of my grief and anxiety is because I want something that's contrary to the way things are. And so I am thwarted against it. And Taoism, I just need to get in the Tao. I need to get in the way of things and just accept and embrace what is and put desire to the side. I think that would be a shame to live. There's an there's a apocryphal sort of um, you know, evangelical uh, story where um, a pastor is having sort of a, a prayer ministry sort of a time with, uh, with somebody who's really struggling with, uh, with lust and uh, with sexual sin and, and that sort of thing. He's just been grappling and grappling and grappling. And the pastor's talking to him. He's like, he's like and, he, and the guy just prays just desperately, God, just take away my, my, my sexual desires. And the, and, the, and the pastor flees. You know, he, he runs away. He goes, I just don't want God to miss. You know, <laughs> yeah. okay? And, and it's saying that the desires we have, they're not bad necessarily. They're not bad necessarily. But sometimes the evil one or our flesh or our opposition, or whatever, will capitalize on those desires in order to undercut our faithfulness to God. And this is what we see in the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. After his baptism, he's out in the, in the wilderness, and we got, we're all familiar with the story, perhaps, where um, he's been fasting for 40 days, and Satan comes to tempt him and says, hey, listen, if you are who you say you are, why don't you take these stones and turn them into bread for yourself? His hunger and his desire for food isn't evil or bad. And so Satan uses that as an opportunity to antagonize him and say, validate yourself. Satisfy, your, satisfy this desire your way. Or actually, I'm asking you to satisfy your desire my way, but I want you to think it's your way. All that's important is it's not God's way. You know, take you up to on the, on the peak of the, of the temple. Throw yourself off if, there's, if you're the son of God. Throw yourself off and the angels will come and they will, they will pick you up so you don't cast your foot against a stone. Provision, protection, validating who I am, proving who I am, self-actualizing, Jesus self-actualizing his identity. I am the son of God and I want to live that out. I want to live that out. I want people to know. And Satan is saying, feed yourself, protect yourself, validate yourself. Those aren't bad desires. But just do it. Do it my way. Do it your way. It doesn't matter. Just don't do it God's way. You know, here's the kingdoms of the world. Worship me and I will give them to you. Well, Jesus desiring the kingdoms of the world is not a bad thing. I mean, that is his inheritance as Jesus Christ, as the Messiah, as the King of kings, Lord of lords. The, but the path wasn't through submitting to Satan. The path was through submitting to the Heavenly Father, even to death on a cross. And so the, t the desires weren't bad. 
And this is what oftentimes happen, that happens is, is our desires, we, we get cut off at the knees because we go to achieve and realize these desires outside of the will of our loving Heavenly Father. Now, here's the limits of WWJD. What would Jesus do? And the same passages that talk about Jesus' temptation after his baptism, you read about Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Which one is it? I think it's, uh, it's Mark. The Spirit sends Jesus out into the wilderness. Could be translated, drove Jesus out into the wilderness to be tempted. Oh, that's problematic, isn't it? What am I supposed to do with this? You know, I thought, I thought, Peter, didn't you just say a second ago that lead us not into temptation? Part of it was our inner desires, and we, we want the Holy Spirit to change our inner desires so that we're not tempted. But maybe temptation isn't just about evil desires. It's just about desires in general. Okay, well, the Holy Spirit can strengthen me to, to uh, endure that. Yes, absolutely he can. But here the Holy Spirit is driving Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. And I think when we pray this, um, this isn't, in some ways we're encountering the limits of WWJD. What would Jesus do? Be driven by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted? No, please, dear God, no, I don't. <laughs> you know? So I think actually praying this, there's a bit of a humility. Yes, I'm being made like Jesus, but I'm not there yet. <laughs> God, continue to be patient with my fragility. Be patient with what is left in me to be conformed to Christ's likeness. The ways I'm not like him, Lord, thank you that you recognize that. You're mindful of my frame. You know that I'm simply dust. So there's a humility in that. But there's another level. And I think, and, and this is the last thing I want to I leave us with. It's not just praying a humility, knowing that we're not quite like Jesus yet. And we want God to be sympathetic to that and empathetic to that. It's not simply that, but I think that's when we're treating this lead us not into temptation in a really broad, sort of a devotional uh, sort of a sense. And another thing we want to do in encountering any text is say, but what's its place right here? And perhaps Jesus has something quite more specific immediately in mind, though it still has these broader reaching implications. And I don't mean, what I'm going to say, uh, other people have preached, and I'm not meaning to undercut, I'm not, the Lord's Prayer has so many layers. And I just want to add another layer here. Okay, so if somebody else said something different, I'm not saying they were wrong. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm saying this, these are layers. Um, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. When we're praying the Lord's Prayer, we're doing this thing where we're saying, God, your will and your kingdom, this is the priority. This is our desire, even. Okay? And then the next sort of lines um, elaborate on God's kingdom. Give us today our daily bread. Just allow me to be content with enough. Don't give me too much. Don't give me too little. There's a proverb that, um, that this, uh, this portion echoes. Um, Proverbs 30, verses 8 through 9. Um, I'll start in verse 7. Two things I ask of you, O Lord, do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me my daily bread. Otherwise I may have too much and disown you and say, who's the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. Proverbs 30, verses 8 and 9. And there's a sense of don't give me too much and don't let me suffer too little. Just give me enough for today. And I think that that's related to this issue of forgive us in the same way we forgive others. 
And, and uh, Tim spoke about the, the different words for sin and forgiveness. And he talked about things like uh, missing the mark. And he talked about uh, things like um, iniquity and being burdened and bent over. And he talked about Kippur and covering over and carrying away and all these different things. And, and in this, in all of these images, there's this sense of something isn't right. And justice is about making what's not right, right again. And God's justice is peculiar. And it's peculiar because his justice isn't requiring the offender, the ower, the wrongdoer to be the one to then restore and make it right. You've offended, so you will occur, incur the loss. You will incur the payment in order for justice to be done and justice to be realized. God's justice is one where as the offending, or offended party, rather, as the losing party because of our sin, he's saying, I will absorb the cost of that loss. I will not require you to repay me in order to restore what is right. I will swallow that cost myself. And when we pray, forgive us as we forgive others, we're saying, God, hold me accountable to suffer the loss of the iniquity that maybe even somebody else has put on me. And allow me the grace and the mercy to like you, not say, hey you, get over here and pick this up. You owe me. It's justice. But to say, just kind of lay it down, cover it over, carry it away, and absorb that loss in ourselves. And that can happen materially, it can happen emotionally, it can happen relationally, it can happen in so many ways, socially. And so when we get to lead us not into temptation, it's almost like God don't give me too much and don't give me too little. Give me enough so that I can continue to absorb these losses as you have for me. And hold me accountable to that. Don't, don't give me so much that I would be tempted to think I don't need you anymore. Don't allow me to be so concerned with the stuff I have and with the assets or the debts, either material or emotional or relational, that other people owe me, that I'm hoarding up all of these assets in order to protect myself, defend myself, provide for myself, and need nobody. But also, don't let me incur too significant of a loss. God, emotionally, talking about emotionally and relationally, don't let me to be, become just a, 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 a doormat. Don't allow me to be someone who's continually abused and walked over and taken advantage of. And Lord, don't allow my loss as I try to forgive others to become so great that I think you've rejected me. Because everyone else is taking advantage of me and exploiting me. Don't lead me into those two temptations, Lord, please. I understand Jesus did, but I'm not there yet. I want to see your kingdom come. I want to see your will be done. Right here, where I'm at, just like it is in heaven. So give me enough. Hold me accountable to forgive. And don't tempt me with too much. Don't tempt me with too little. But just keep me on this narrow road. Because wide is the path that leads to destruction. And broad is the, broad is the path and wide is the gate that leads to destruction. But narrow is the path and small is the gate that leads to eternal life. And at the end of the day, it is through our faith in Christ, by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that we have our daily bread in all of these respects and are equipped to minister forgiveness, to minister God's will on earth and his kingdom on earth, 
and we are strengthened to withstand broadly temptation as well as this sort of specific context. So let's not let the response be, all right, let's all try harder and let's pray the Lord's Prayer a little bit more intensely. But let's take a moment and let's confess where we've fallen short on that to our good and loving and gracious and merciful God who absorbs our debts and pays them on our behalf and receive from him his forgiveness and his spirit to equip us to move forward. Amen? Amen. Yeah, question. Oh, I love questions. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. And genuinely, I mean, it, ideally to this, but if you've got another question, I'm, I'm, you know, whatever. Yes. Yeah, and I might, I might just mildly tweak that to say, as we live faithfully day by day, he gives us a spirit to then live for him rather than as we, you know, classic Galatians chapter three. Is it, you know, you foolish Galatians who has bewitched you before your very eyes, Christ was clearly presented as crucified. I want to know just one thing. Did you receive the spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law or because you believe what you heard? And faith is always first. And faith is always in Christ, that is, is then followed with the Holy Spirit who then equips us to go and do the good works. But to your point, authentic faith is always legitimized, authenticated by the lives that we live. There's a, there's a phenomenal passage in Ecclesiastes, um, and uh, it gets avoided because it's, it's a, well, Ecclesiastes is just kind of tough, isn't it? I mean, if anybody read Ecclesiastes and go, oh, sweet Moses, goodness, what the, how'd this get in? You know? And some of us are like, yes, because I'm a morbid pessimist. It's fantastic. And others are like, why in the world? What does, uh? anyway, um, let me see if I can find it. Uh, Ecclesiastes 7, 16. Do not be over-righteous, neither be over-wise. Why destroy yourself? Do not be over-wicked, and do not be a fool. Why die before your time? It is good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. The man who fears God will avoid all extremes, or sometimes translated, moves forward with them both. And this is coupled with this Jewish idea of the middle way. And we typically think of the middle way as being moderate, a bit lukewarm, a little bit tepid, a little bit indecisive, not really sure. Uh, and the, the ancient Hebrew idea of being the, of the middle way is not one of, of indecision, but it's one of, of actually wisdom. And uh, you know, Deuteronomy, this book of the law, you shall not depart from it to the right or to the left. And that exhortation is, is frequently uh, repeated in the Old Testament. And the idea is, um, it, it is, you, you hold them both. And there's a time there is a time to cast away stones, and there is a time to gather them together. There is a time for everything under the sun. And the wise person is the person who spiritually is able to discern by the word of God, through the ministry of the spirit of God, amongst the people of God, what is the time now? 
what is this time that we're living in? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're right. Yeah, Ma- um, it's really the, the Mark one. The Matthew uh, 4 1, he's led into the desert to be tempted. Um, in uh, Luke 4, he's led and was tempted. So Matthew has this idea of purpose to be. Um, and Mark is the one that uh, can be a bit strong. Some people translate it a bit more strongly. Uh, verse 12, at once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert 40 days being tempted. So Mark has this idea of, of really being sent or otherwise translated driven. He was compelled. It's almost like when he had to go through Samaria. I must go through Samaria before the encounter with the woman on the well. Um, and then, uh, so that's the idea of this real drive. And it's Matthew um, and Luke that we got to get the idea of being led into. And then um, Matthew really gives this to be tempted. There is this really important sort of, no, Jesus was meant to be tempted. And it's really important in Hebrews as well that he was tempted in every way we are, but was without sin. And that's what makes him a high priest who's able to sympathize with us. Let me see if I can find that reference for you real quick so you know I'm not making it up. You're aware? Okay. Yeah. Mm. The way I look at it is, when you are a, let's say I want to have this possibility, mm-hmm. I want to earn money, then I do this. But the proper all stops. I want to get that. Yeah. To me, understanding this is taking a step. Yeah. And that's how you know. And taking a step, I think a lot of people like, oh, take a step, I need to take a step up on it. Isn't that the case? <laughs> but it's like a drop for me. Yeah. When I want to be happy. Mm. To, to my desire no yeah that's a lovely application yeah absolutely <laughs> no I, I think it makes perfect sense and that's uh, ultimately what Satan is tempting Jesus with in the wilderness is here's a shortcut validate yourself provide for yourself protect yourself get get what you're already going to get but get it quicker and get it my way <laughs> you know <laughs> Um, so no, I think that's uh, spot on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's great. I mean, I think, um, well, first of all, you're absolutely right to bring it up. I think it's, it's a, an associated uh, truth. God doesn't let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. He always provides a way out um, for us. I remember a guy, um, and he, he would have no idea that I've carried this with me for as many years as I have. I mean, it's not loads of years. It's about six years. Um, but he, he helped with the youth group, uh, a youth group that I led, and he used to tell the guys, he said, the best way to avoid the situation is avoid the situation. You know? 
just plain and simple. You can't say you're trying to avoid the situation when you're just full on into it. And, um, and God won't let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. We can always, there's always, always, always a way out. Even if, if the, the Holy Spirit has led us down a path that includes temptation, um, there, you know, Jesus combats the temptation uh, with, with Scripture and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, and, uh, and Jesus, and I learned this lesson a, a, a rough way. Um, I, was, I was in a situation, uh, a season in life where, like, I was just re- the temptation was strong. By God's grace, I wasn't indulging it um, um, significantly. Uh, I think with any temptation, we sit back and go, you, we all just sort of dip our toe in. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but, um, and I, I was thinking a lot about um, Jesus and, and when he tells us, you know, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better to, you know, enter eternal life maimed and mutilated than, you know, be sent to, to hell, essentially. Um, is the, and, and unfortunately, some people have taken that very literally in some, in some situations. Um, but the point is, Jesus is making is be as extreme as necessary. And what we all know is it doesn't take gouging out our eyes and cutting off our hands to avoid the situation. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, and we all like, to, and it's like, it's like, you know, when you tell, I tell my kids to clean the room and all of a sudden, I, but I've got homework to do. It's like, shut <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, they're all of a sudden, you know, um, and, and we can find reasons to avoid doing what we're meant to do. And we're ingenious at coming up with ways in which just this temptation is unavoidable. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think you're exactly right, uh, you know, to bring it up. Uh, no temptation is seized. You accept what has come to man. And there's always a way out. There's always a way out. And we don't ever have to be as extreme as we like to convince ourselves so we would have to be as extreme. Uh, good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, if I understand it properly, it's a paraphrase, you know, um, rather than a translation. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I think, I think they, they, go, they go hand in hand, but at the same time, I think um, a lot of that is our cultural sort of associations to particular bits of vocabulary. Because um, I think we could kind of go equally negative with testing. Why is God testing me? Why, why, why is he putting this exam in front of me as though I'm, you know, trying to pass my A-levels? God just doesn't know whether or not I love, love him and he has to test me and he has to, you know, um, it, it, just, it just depends on, on kind of our association with different bits of vocabulary, really. Um, I, I think both have their legitimate place in, in understanding it and I, I think it's, you know, the task of communication is always how do we take an idea and then encode it in a way that whoever's receiving that coding can decode it and arrive at the same idea that you're hoping they would arrive at. You, you know, um, and so that just, I think, gets to the, the tricky bit of, of, of communication. Um, I don't have a problem with considering it testing, but nevertheless, the, the principle still stands, and that's we have a desire, and there is an opportunity to uh, take a shortcut, achieve that good desire, a wrong way, the wrong way, um, or there is an evil desire, um, and we're being tested or tempted or or uh, revealed. <laughs> you know, I mean, in a lot of ways, you say there's a revelation. Who am I? You know, um, what's going on inside my heart? Here's a situation. Who are you, Peter Nevins? Who are you? We go, oh crap, <laughs> I'm a turd. <laughs> you know, um, or oh wow, actually, um, I'm a redeemed. Son of God, and I, I was able to withstand that, and I had the strength to, like, that actually didn't even, that didn't even tempt me. Wow, that would have tempted me three years ago, you know, and so in some sense, it's, a, it's also a, a time of revelation. Yeah.
Yeah, I mean, I think it. I, th I think test. If, if if we're going to continue down the testing sort of sort of track, I think testing is broader. Temptation might be a form of test, because certainly Scripture says, "Consider pure joy when you're faced trials of many kinds," because we know that the testing of our faith develops perseverance, and perseverance finishes its work, so we can be mature and complete. Um, and certainly, those tests. Um, uh, I think temptation, I in really broad swathes of thinking, you know, persecution is a test because we're tempted to abandon, you know, and, and so the two certainly aren't um, very cleanly disassociated. Uh, however, at the same time, I might rejoice in the test of persecution, but I'm not really rejoicing in the test of temptation. If I'm being just bluntly honest, I mean, maybe others are like, bring it on! Y you're a better man or woman than I am. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking about that we sometimes Yeah, um, James, both James and Peter have, have something to say about tests and trials. I think they should be held as distinct from temptation, though temptation is probably an associated occurrence. Oh, really, to the time of trial. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to find my, my best entry point. That's why I'm pausing. Um, There are a lot of different ways I could, I, could, I could step into this. Forgiveness, I don't think, can ever be overstated in terms of its centrality and, and just, yeah, its centrality to Christian faith. Um, one of the things that I've, I've grappled with in the sort of social justice discourse um, is where do I fit as a white middle class English speaking male in that? And where do my experiences, being of a particular age, a particular ethnicity, a particular gender, a particular socioeconomic, where do my experiences fit in that sort of broader discussion? And I spend a lot of time in these sorts of discussions and I've heard a lot of stories of, of pain and loss, whether that be um, discriminated against people groups in America, uh, whether that be um, stories from abroad. Um, most recently I spent some time in Burundi uh, where they have the same problems Rwanda has had as far as Hutus and Tutsis and that sort of thing, um, and civil war and genocide and that, that sort of thing. And, um, and I've spent some time in uh, Palestine, Israel, and you, kinda, you see these sort of, these bits of pain and loss. And the social justice discourse, popularly speaking, by and large, consists around marshalling the moral authority of justice in order to coerce an offender towards a new course of action or some sort of restitution. Um, very simply, we, we see that in, um, in incarceration. Somebody breaks the law um, and so they're incarcerated. They, there's some sort of loss of liberty. There's some sort of penalty that is paid. There's some sort of debt to society that is owed in order to, um, in order to bring um, not only retribution but restoration and to recover rightness. And in the presence of injustice and in the presence of sin and in the presence of transgression and iniquity and all of these different things, something needs to happen to restore rightness because a loss has already been incurred. The de facto situation is we've all lost. And each of us has caused loss. A loss of 
uh, a loss of dignity, a loss of honor, a loss of humanity, a loss of material goods, a loss of uh, opportunity. There are all these losses. And, um, and curiously, though we think the God of the Old Testament is God of anger and wrath and justice in a retributional sense, and those narratives are included, what is really interesting is at the center of what it means to be Jewish in the Old Testament is the worship of God on the Day of Atonement. And the worship of God on the Day of Atonement is a time where all of those losses are disassociated, those debts and those losses are disassociated from the debtor the offending party. Whether that be unintentional sins with sacrifices or even intentional sins upon the scapegoat and the scapegoat is taken out to the wilderness, someone or something else incurs the loss in the act of forgiveness. And all of those, on on the Ark of the Covenant, the lid is called the atonement cover. Um, or which is redundant, it's call, calling it the cover cover, but um, sometimes it's called the mercy seat. And actually the God of the Old Testament is a God of mercy. And the violence of an atonement is simply a mirror or a reflection of the violence of justice. Every bit of justice is violent. I don't care what you're talking about. Incarceration is violent. You are physically limiting somebody's mobility. You're limiting their ability to work. You're you're limiting their ability to provide for the family. An act of violence has been done to the incarcerated. That doesn't make it wrong. It just means let's call a spade a spade and say it's violent. Economic boycotts are violent oppositions to injustice. And if they aren't, then we can't talk about economic violence in terms of social justice discourse. Justice is violent. And what happens is the violence of justice is then located at the altar in order to then achieve and find mercy with God. And those things are a shadow of the reality. And interestingly also, the Day of Atonement didn't just atone for the, it didn't just cleanse the people of their sin. It also cleansed the tabernacle, the temple, the worship place of the sin. And this idea that God housed himself among his people and in that housing accrued the residue of their sin on his dwelling place and that needed to be purged. And all of this is a shadow, the author of Hebrews tells us, of what Christ has accomplished. He tabernacled among us. And he walked around and accrued the residue of our sin because he's the tabernacle, he's the temple. But he's also the sacrifice, and on him has been laid the iniquity of us all. And he's also the priest who performs, he self sacrifices. And the act, the, the interesting thing, I, I, I'm sorry, I have to confess, I just finished a dissertation on this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. The, the, <laughs> yeah. the, the, Greek, the, the Greek word, hilasterion, um, the Greek word hilasterion is used once in Romans and once in Hebrews, and it gets translated uh, as atonement sacrifice or mercy seat, and it is a reflection of of this Day of Atonement, the mercy seat um, over the Ark of the Covenant. But interestingly, hilasterion also gets used as a description of the ledge around the altar of sacrifice. And there's this way in which violence and mercy are in a, in a situation of present injustice, violence and mercy are inalienable. The question is, who will receive the violence? And what is the nature of the justice? And Romans 8, uh, um, yeah, is that right? Yeah. 
Um, it's just for a dissertation on this, I don't know. Um, anyway, Jesus Christ has been revealed as Hilasterion, the place of sacrifice and the place of mercy. So he is the temple, he is the tabernacle, he is the, uh, he is the sacrifice, he is the priest, and then he has gone to the real, you know, Ark of the Covenant, the real holy place in his ascension, so that we can follow him and, and, and find, receive grace and find mercy in our time of need. And so what we have embodied is, in Christ is the self-acceptance and the self-affliction or infliction, not sure which word to use, of the violence of justice in order to extend forgiveness and mercy to the other. And we are called to be little Christs, Christians places where we aren't extra victimized by the sin that has been done to us, but we willingly, consciously, voluntarily, happily, though painfully and regrettably self-inflict the violence of justice that is rightfully due another person and incur yet further loss to the original loss we suffered in order to extend forgiveness and mercy to the other and find a place of reconciliation. Reconciliation isn't a guarantee. Just like we're not reconciled to God simply because Jesus has forgiven us. We need to step into that forgiveness. We need to receive that forgiveness. You know, we need to come into the same reality. Confession is to say the same as. We need to, get, Proverbs, can two walk together unless they are agreed? We have to come to an agreement on what the reality is in order to be reconciled. And though we pursue reconciliation with everybody, it might not be achievable. However, we do extend forgiveness to everybody. There's a guy from Burundi, his name is Dudone Nahimane, and um, he, yeah, yeah. <laughs> are you impressed? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dudone Nahimana. Um, and, uh, and he's actually in the UK right now. I got a chance to see him again, and I partnered with him down in Bujumbura, and um, he, uh, he tells the story of how his family was murdered during a genocidal civil war in Burundi, and the, the occasion where he encountered his father's murder and extended forgiveness and what that is like, and how his family and the family of this man have come together for reconciliation projects, where the land where genocide had taken place and all this blood was spilt, they are farming together. And out of this sort of blood-soaked soil raising up new life, half of the crops are serving a street children's project that uh, Dudone runs in Bujumbura called New Generation, and the other half is split evenly and equally across the, um, the, the, the two families. And he said this, he was speaking at a, uh, at a, a breakfast uh, thing, and he says, uh, he says, no matter what, I am ready to forgive because I am not willing to be a slave. And not forgiving someone, we all know, doesn't do anything or it doesn't hurt the other person. It doesn't, they already don't care about me. <laughs> not forgiving them, <laughs> no, you know, unless they've come to a place of repentance. In which case, my withholding of forgiveness is extra egregious, you know. Um, but um, extending forgiveness liberates me from the bitterness and the anger and the revenge and the toxicity of those things to a human soul. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll tell you what, what we'll do, um, we'll, we'll bring you to a close because it links brilliantly with Lani coming next. Cool. Week.